This, this is TLV1. The Tel Aviv Review. Hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. I'm your host, Gilad Halpern. Every week we bring you conversations with authors about the books and research and other things that we like. And if you like us, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter by going to our homepage. That's tlv1.fm slash Tel Aviv Review. Scroll down to the bottom and click the big red button that says Patreon. Click and support us. Some of you have been doing this for months and years and we simply cannot thank you enough. This episode is part of a series in partnership with the Israel office of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, taking a deep dive into issues that shape our lives here in Israel. My guest today is a professor of education specializing in education policy. She's a research fellow and the head of the education policy program at the Israel Democracy Institute and is a lecturer at Hakibutzim College of Education. Dr. Tammy Hoffman, hello and welcome to the Tel Aviv Review. Thank you. I will not let my schooling interfere with my education. <laughs> This is uh, one of my favorite Mark Twain aphorisms. Uh, but you seem to claim the opposite, that schooling is still the main generator of education, especially, especially when it comes to democracy education. How so? It's not that I don't agree with Mark Twain. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Yeah. Yeah, of course. But I think that we live today in an age... And I think it was true also in other times. But uh, in this age, uh, where most of the spheres where people, you know, shape their identity and become who they are, are either volunteer, in a volunt- volunteer in nature, you know, non-formal education, your friends, okay? or random You were born in, for a certain family or in a certain community. And today you also have your feed in the, you know, in the social media and you, you know, just scroll there. And so this is all very random and very uh, volunteer, uh, volunteer in, in nature. And I think that the only place today that you have the potential, maybe it's not always... <laughs> you know, fulfill it this potential, but the only place where you have the potential to um, think and make a very distinctive and uh, intentional uh, process, educational process for uh, students or for the citizens of the future is the public education. Now, in Israeli terms, When I think about 15 years of mandatory education, you know, you go from age three to age 18 in a state monitored, funded, this way or the, or the other, uh, of education. So what happens there in the average of uh, seven, eight hours per day? And this should be a very conscious and deliberate process. arena for the question of how will uh, our children or the next generation of uh, citizens uh, will cope or be able to cope in this world who the only thing I can say about its future is that I have no idea how it's going to look like. I only know that it changes rapidly and I know that it, brings challenges that we did not express before. And all of them together, and we maybe we'll get to that later, but all of these challenges uh, pose a major threat about uh, for the possibility of a democratic society to continue to thrive and to be democratic in nature and not just by name. There is a sense... I mean, let's put aside the causes for it for a second, but there is a sense that there has been an erosion in uh, in Israel at least. Mm-hmm. We'll get to the rest of the world in a second. In the nature of democracy education right. and the sort of content that is being instilled in children in the education system. Is there, is there a real truth in that or is it yeah. just... No, there is a real truth in that. But to be fair, you know, we can go uh, way back, but... focusing on the last decades. This was not the main 
a focus of educational policy in Western countries and, of course, in Israel, specifically in Israel, and we'll get to that uh, different because there is some unique f- characteristics here. But part of the problem of being in, uh, uh, living in a democratic culture, in democratic culture, uh, In democracy is that it's not something that you were born with the um, the knowledge or the skills or the capacity to understand what it means to live in a democratic society is not something and that was true always it's not something that you are born with it needs to be taught cultivated practiced and experienced you know even like we talk about training you know training the muscles so it's the muscles of democracy it's not something that is intuitive for people so it needs to be taught and you could see you can see throughout the decades a decline in the commitment to do that uh, from various reasons I think the main one or the two main ones really generally speaking are Is that it's considered to be um, you know part of life of course I'm living in democracy so oh, it's I'm there it's there yeah it's yeah. not something that is an issue and the other thing is that I think the policy education of the 2000 went towards very narrow liberal principles of uh, applied applied to education and In terms of measurement and putting your focus on stem uh, professions you know English math science and uh, talking about the global citizenship of the world and the market and the free market and in a way it um, put aside or marginalized a lot of uh, disciplines that first are hard to measure that way like humanities philosophy ethics and And at the end, uh, when it's marginalized, it's not in you know in the focus of the thing. So you do have an erosion. And then the door is wide open for all kinds of uh, counter phenomena. Uh, and we see it very um, such as nationalism. Well, well it's not ultra nationalism it's not nationalism. We always right. had nationalism. Yeah. So it's ultra nationalism. And it's also, You know the whole issue of post truth era of how do I know what I know and do I have trust in the institution that you know uh, are in the government and so forth so I think at the combination of that there is an uh, there is a decline in the commitment and just one other thing about that is that also the question of what it means and what does it entail to have a education for democracy and can I say for sure that if I'll do this and that in school I will have specific outcomes is something that is really hard to say and is debatable mm-hmm. yeah but but the, it, the whole thing now with school versus the outside mm-hmm. environment is that there's so many detrimental effects to the outside environment I mean we touched mm-hmm. upon them briefly but Uh, whether it is uh, social media or just mm-hmm. the, the wider public uh, discourse how do you ensure or even I don't know ensure is perhaps the wrong word but how do you make an effort that uh, uh, the education system and the school curriculum might be able in some way to uh, uh, to fend that off I mean you said that the only you Uh, the only place the only forum where you have like long-term processes of education is the schooling system how is it not uh, uh, um, a false hope well you know first of all in education uh, you can't talk about false hope <laughs> because it you know undermines the whole idea of education so you have so uh, I'll quote something that you... No, no, I'm not, I'm not yeah, saying... Yeah, I know, I know, I know. I'm, I'm only saying... No, but what, it's important. How, how do you trust the schooling system uh, to, not, be, to be the one, the, okay. the, uh, uh, the dam against it? First that. of all, it's before I trust, we have to create uh, a public and also a government commitment to do that. 
So it's before, do I trust? I trust a teacher that I know that will do this and that or a school. But talking generally about an education system that is, of course, uh, very heterogeneous uh, in, in its nature, um, it's not a question about trust. It's how uh, do I make sure that teachers and stakeholders see themselves as uh, with the ownership and the agency to do that. So this is the first step. And because this is not the case in general, there are teachers, there are principals, there are stakeholders, but in general speaking, we don't see that. So this is the main goal. In order for us to uh, help schools to become what they can become in that area, there is a lot of work to do in terms of teacher education, in uh, education policy, and so forth. You know, in the last year protests against uh, the judicial uh, reform, uh, there were a lot of groups that were saying, uh, without uh, education, there is no democracy. Okay? And I'm not sure about that, <laughs> because, you know, there, you have countries you have um, in the world that are, you know, have uh, great, uh, great, great scores in all the international exams and are considered to be leading in terms of uh, STEM and, and things like that. They don't have democracy necessarily. So education can, not only that it does not require democracy, but it also can be uh, the, the vehicle to undermine democracy even more. So you have here a double effort in order to say that there is no democracy without education for democracy. And I think this is the main uh, shift that was needed in those um, no, uh, no, but I would think that when people say education, they mean. Like I the, know uh, what they mean. I yeah. know what they mean. But I, they don't mean like a teacher and a classroom, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah. But then, in order to understand, I think that in order to understand the area we are talking about, we have to say, okay, what does it mean, this education? And because we are not uh, asking these kinds of questions. And I think education system is the place where these questions need to be asked, and they are not. So, of course, all the good people in the streets, you know, even, of course, we understand what they mean. It's, it's the same as, I'll give you another example for that. This is also part of the uh, education for democracy problem or challenge. In 2014, you know, former uh, uh, the Minister of Education, Shai Piron, has launched a whole curriculum about the other is me, and in Hebrew. So, and sort of like an, uh, um, fostering empathy. Yeah, and, empathy yeah. and multiculturalism and tolerance and pluralism. So, we all understand what the the slogan means. Okay? It means, of course. You know, it means to, you know, love the other like yourself. Okay. The problem is that the other is not me. And if it was me, if it, it would be me, there was no problem. Because it's not me, there is a problem. And what we saw also uh, in reports and throughout the years, that people went very easily you know, teachers and schools to very soft otherness that don't um, make them confront or challenge, you know, a real uh, conflict of identities and and, and uh, opinions. So, of course, we understand what they mean when there is no democracy without education. But what does it mean, and what needs to be in order, really, to sustain democracy? That's a whole new. Yeah, so the, question. there's a question of, of policy, of education of policy here. And of course, policy is dictated by the government. Yeah. And I mean, again, um, it, again it, it's another what's the point question here. Um, when s the government, today's government, mm -hmm. is actually one of the main forces working against mm -hmm. all the things that you are uh, uh, advocating right. for. I mean, how do you 
convince the government to do something that is against exactly its political project? The challenge didn't start, didn't start with this government. In this area, we are in this challenge for decades. I will go even further to say that when I was growing up in Israel and going to high school, I was also not... Just to clue our listeners in, I'm guessing that was in the 80s and 90s. Oh, you give me... Uh, <laughs> that's nice. No, it was in the 80s. Okay. Yeah, it was in the 80s. The 90s, I was already <laughs> in the else. army. Okay. Somewhere else in the army. Uh, so, yeah, it was around the 80s. I mean, the, I finished uh, high school in 88. So it's the first intifada. Okay? And so I will say that we didn't learn education for democracy. We learned civics, like everyone else today also will say about it. A word in a minute but we also did not learn education for democracy and I also say a generation before me and before me what's the catch here or what's the difference is that the commitment the social national uh, you know cultural commitment to the idea of a Jewish democratic state and democratic in terms of its liberal values was unquestionable and I think it's not, um, for me, it was interesting that when the protests started a year and a half ago, um, the first people you saw on the streets were older generations, or the people who were born in the 40s and 50s, because it was really non-negotiable. And then you started to see the other generation come forth. So the problem is not... This government. The government here is what you see that works against it, as you said, uh, is a culmination of a process of many years. Now, policy, education policy, does not work only top down. It works also, it's like a negotiation between different stakeholders. And not all the stakeholders are government. And it's also a negotiation between different actors in the education field. Especially in Israel, you have many different actors uh, within the education field that work also in that. So how do I work towards that? First of all, I acknowledge that we have decades of delay. <laughs> okay? Now we have to start from somewhere. And you work simultaneously with government and MP members and members of the Knesset and uh, other, you know, stakeholders in the academia and in uh, teacher training uh, colleges and in uh, municipalities and in all in philanthropy. And so you have many stakeholders that together. It's not that it's them and it's the government. You also have people in the Knesset and in the government that you can work with. So I think it is a big challenge, not to say a battle. It is a battle. Uh, but if there is any kind of, um, you know, redemption for Israeli society, and I think it's connected to what's going on with the ongoing war, and it's, it has to do with a lot of things, is how will our uh, society will be in the day after, whenever that will be. Yes, so this I want to ask you, I mean, actually I want to ask you when you said that it's a, a process of several decades, but I wonder to what extent did it really become worse uh, since the 7th of mm -hmm. October? So we're talking a year now, mm -hmm. or is it too soon to tell? I mean, what, what really are the long-term effects of... I would even say the radicalization of uh, uh, the Israeli debate in, in yeah. many terms when it comes to um, you know, tolerance and the, the, the uh, understanding of democracy and uh, civic rights, human rights, etc. There is a radicalization, for sure. But again, it's not coming on you know, an open, vast ground. It has history. And it has a background. It started before that. You could see 
for example, you know, I was a teacher for many years, a history teacher from the 90s. So, and in high school, and you could see throughout the years, specifically going into the middle, you know, the second decade of the 2000, 2010 and, and on, you could see the change of the sentiment. You talk about civil rights and they said, oh, you are a lefty or you know, things that you did not have before. So I think the whole, the, the uh, Israeli society, the Jewish uh, Israeli society has gone to the right more um but the main problem is not going to the right it's about going or try starting to identify judaism and democracy as two separate things that also contradict each other of course it has to do with the non-separation of you know religious religion and state in israel and lack of constitution of course and all the things that So and, we, and also the fact that it, it benefits politically uh, one sector, right? I mean, when you have yeah. to choose between Jewish and democratic, you right. know, which, uh, I mean, what kind of choice would benefit what political camp? Yes, but this is because, this is only because you, you had the split. So, for example, the national religious stream in Israel, you know, the religious Zionism, there was no there was no such split you know throughout the first decades i will also say on a personal note if i can you know uh, my you great among friends yeah oh yeah of course my great grandfather was one of zev jabotinsky a very prominent zionist leader you know right wing revisionist zionist leader uh, best friends and together they with other eight uh, friends, they uh, uh, initiated the Revis uh, Revisionist uh, Zionist uh, uh, Federation in Riga, in Latvia. So I think he, would he have known what happened to the idea of democracy and liberal democracy in this age, he would really, you know... Freak out. Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think that the problem is not that it's The, the issue we need to stress is not religious or non-religious. And it's not left and right anymore. It's liberal and non-liberal. It's even not conservative or progressive. I think it's a, it's a misleading uh, split. You have to think about liberals and non-liberals. And because I can be religious and I can be uh, le uh, left and I can be right In left and right uh, political terms and I can have different opinions about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and about occupation and, and but I can hold you know the issue of commitment to liberal democracy You mentioned uh, um, civic studies before um, and maybe we can spend a bit yeah. of time on this how is civic, like the civic studies with, that you know people of our generation and above learned at school decades ago, uh, different from what you call uh, education for democracy? It's not just before, it's also today. So the civic, civics as a, a curricular you know, discipline in a school, which always was, and also you have it in other places in the world, is part of civic education and education for democracy. It's not education for democracy by itself. It has a very specific function. It's the part that's supposed to talk about, you know, the information that needs for the, um, um, how the state is built, the system, you know, the institutions and things like that. And in Israel, this is a, a very um, debatable arena. It went through all different kinds of changes. If you, we think about the pendulum of uh, you know Jewish democratic state, so you had in the 90s a more um, universalistic uh, point you know of the curriculum of civics and then as a, even as a backlash you know uh, the effect you have uh, the change that we see today it didn't start today. it started all already in 
the 2010 and fourth that go into the more uh, Israel as the uh, national the nation state of the Jewish people so you have you know uh, a different um, um, the pendulum moves but I would like to argue that even if civics as a discipline and the teachers and some of them are great really doing wonderful things wonderful and important work that even if all of the civics uh, in all streams were great and the curriculum was exactly how all of the professionals and scholars would say it should be okay? we're talking about two to four hour two to three hours in uh, ninth grade if it happens but according to the You know the curriculum it should be and we are talking about between four to six hours per week on 11 and 12th grade for a matriculation of two points that's quite a lot isn't it when oh. I'm looking at 15 years mm. of studying from kindergarten and I compare it to civic education in Israel and that focuses on the particular values, Jewish identity, national identity, Zionist identity, it's nothing. And it happens only when you are already, you know, you finish kindergarten, you finish uh, elementary school, it's the end of uh, junior high, and it's another matriculation. So when, we, when I talk about civic education, about education for democracy, I'm not talking about a subject matter in the curriculum. We're talking about something that has, of course, curriculum manifestations, but it's embedded in the climate, in the culture, in the way you talk about things. And this is not happening. So essentially, demo- education for democracy is... In a way, well, I wouldn't call it extracurricular. No, it's not but, extracurricular. But, but it's, it's not something that you study with books and matriculate in necessarily. No, you can also study with books. And I'll give you an example. If I teach, um, if I teach geography, which is a very uh, underappreciated uh, subject <laughs> in Israel and should be, give much more place. But if I'm teaching geography, and I'm talking about, for example, borders, okay, the whole issue of borders, and how do nations and states and places are, how borders are um, distinguished, decided, accepted, and so forth. And I'm not saying a word about understanding the map of Israel. Okay? Now, it doesn't matter if you think that it's, it should be Uh, the borders should be this way or that way. But it's to understand that you have the green line, to understand what it means. You can think it's not supposed to be there, you can think it should, sub- doesn't matter, but, but to understand what it means. Why all the maps in Israel, are, uh, that are the official maps in schools are, you know, the physic, uh, f- uh, physical map, you say? The physical maps, not, you know, maps that really draw all the lines and all the different you have. So if I have done that, that's also part of education for democracy. And the ability to talk about how do I know what I know in this age? On what ground do I say what I say? Now, Today, with the, the, the beat of these lives, of the life we, we lead uh, in this world, you know, with the bytes and the uh, X and uh, Twitter, X and uh, um, Twitter and TikTok and all that, the only place of Xen that has the potential to sit together and say, okay, what does it mean? What does it mean post-truth? What does it mean? What is populism? Where do I see it? And I'm still not saying good, bad. I'm just trying to understand the phenomena. Okay? What's going on now with the um, debate about the, the war and the way it's led? And, okay? So 
I think that the question is that education for democracy, it has to have a strong um, civics you know, curriculum, but the civics curriculum is not enough. It's a really small part. You have the participation part and you have the activism part and you have political literacy part and, of course, understanding all kinds of uh, expressions and things in order to be able to make your own mind and not just what you, the TikTok showed you. Another function that you ascribe a, a significant role to uh, for the education system is really how to deal with issues of media literacy and really teaching kids to uh, basically discern uh, um, truth from post or non-truths. Mm -hmm. And you have developed uh, right. uh, quite an extensive educational right. uh, toolbox mm -hmm. to deal with uh, um, with uh, fake news, etc. Um, what really are the main elements that uh, need to be transferred to children and how do you do it? I think the main thing is, also, is, again, and this is a very good example, is the context. Uh, when I talk about AI, for example, today in schools... What is the context in which I'm talking about AI? Is it a functional context? I want you to know that there is an AI and it's really cool and you can do all kinds of stuff with it. If I'm a teacher, do I want to make my teaching, you know, use it? But do I talk about AI and the rapid uh, development of it in terms of ethics, in terms of understanding Uh, what it can, you know, trying to uh, imagine or to think again about what does it mean about person-to-person uh, uh, -person relations? What does it mean? What, what does it, the relationship between man and machine, what does it mean? What it, what it will do? Right? So these are all questions that we're not doing when we talk about AI, for example. We talk about fake news and about the dangers of the web and social media. So, of course, there are dangers, <laughs> dangers in the media. And when you go to school, you see that the main focuses are on, you know, shaming, bullying, and, of course, uh, dangers like, you know, predators that are trying to get to children, which is very important to deal with. But when you are not taking it, to the context of civics and society and um, cohesion and it's not just me and we cannot fight the social media it's here it's here to stay so now I need to navigate in it and I have to understand not that just the dangers but also the opportunities for making change for good that are in there So I have to be very conscious. And the most important um, skill we need to cultivate is critical thinking. Now, we did in the IDI, together with the uh, Internet, uh, the Israeli Internet Union and uh, Mahon Mufet, in Mufet Institute, and together with uh, the pedagogical secretary in, uh, in the Ministry of Education. So this is talking about working with Uh, uh, the Ministry of Education to try and, and put all of this idea of language, of media, of uh, media literacy um, and uh, digital uh, med literacy in terms of civic media literacy and say, look, it's not a lesson where you give the, the rules of How to find, how to understand what is a fake news, to see the signs. And it's not only for media classes. This is something that me as a math teacher, I need to work on in my class with my math curriculum. And I think the main innovation in that, um, in that platform was called Fake or Not. Uh, but the main innovation is putting all of those issues in terms of bigger questions and say, how do I teach critical uh, thinking 
through lit- uh, civic media literacy and the 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 purpose of the critical thinking is not just to uh okay I don't want to get fake news and I don't need to which is very important of course but is also to allow me to practice and exercise uh, those skills and uh, I think this is the main um, innovation in that platform and and Uh, the Adenauer uh, Foundation helped us you know to establish it and we're thankful for that um, and it brings a new uh, a new perspective to deal with the digital world today in social media it says well yes there are dangers but we have to start talking about it as part of our civil society and to understand that The many questions civic questions democratic questions we need to ask about us using all of this how does Israel fare compared to other countries on the one hand uh, we have a much bigger engagement of uh, the public in such issues of democracy and government etc on the other we um, Other countries don't struggle with attention of Jewish and democratic and right. all those things that uh, we've been uh, uh, dealing with for for so long with varying degrees of success well first of all when you look at uh, you know uh, global measurements index of level of democracy so you see the decline in Israel in Israel So something is not work compared to other countries. compared to other countries and compared to ourselves mm-hmm. okay so Israeli democracy was always uh, had the problem with uh, check and balances and lack of constitution and of course the uh, non-separation of uh, religion and state um, I think uh, in terms of education education for democracy we have two to major problems that you don't see in other places or at least not in that capacity first of all is the way the the education system is built we are not a system we are systems and they are all funded this way or the other by the government so it's not you have private and you have public no everything is public in a way everything is funded and You're talking about the sectorial yeah, division? sectorial division between you know um, religious state and state and Haradim and, okay. and Arab and, and Arabs yeah. and secular and and I think what will what can exemplify that and that's a really big problem and I'm not saying it's not in other places also but in such a small country as Israel with all its challenges uh, it's it's A big issue and we see it today in the streets in the media and everywhere you have the the kids that uh, graduated do you have the graduate cohort uh, from this summer and then I'm bringing them a whole here with us in the studio okay and uh, and I said okay what's what do they have in common to make them a society to make them You know continue and be a society because we talk a lot about solidarity and union and being together and together will win and and then I look and said okay actually they don't have almost nothing in common most of them have the blue ID you know they are Israeli citizens so they are citizens but they don't necessarily have a mindset of the democratic the citizen yeah, yeah they have the paper and all of them speak Hebrew to some level of From very poorly to great Hebrew that's it and that's not enough so you have a lot of cohesion among uh, within communities but not as a whole and in that terms we are in a very big problem and, and you think that is due to the separation within yeah, the I'm sure. education system I'm sure this is part of it there's never I'm coming from history there's never <laughs> one you know factor but uh, it's part of it because throughout the years and the uh, process we talked about here you have it's not just that they learn in different places they learn different things and they learn different interpretations 
to very fundamental uh, topics like what is democracy? What is equality? What is the role of uh, human rights? Freedom of speech. But they have different answers that sometimes contradict each other to these questions. And when you have that, you know, when you look at the future, you said, okay, so where that, does that leave me? And if I'm going even further, very, I'm going into this time that we are in. I'm looking at the kids that are learning now, the students that are in 11th, 12th grade. They uh, were the corona generation in junior high. A part of being in the age of junior high, <laughs> of, uh, in, uh, um, they really suffered a lot. And we have from research, we know what happened when they came back from the corona and from the online and uh, a lot much more violent, much more, uh, you know, obligation for authority or for schools or whatever. And now they experience the war with everything that brings, and I'm not talking even about those who come from the North and the South that are not at home, you know, for the past year. So we have here a whole generation that not only have, does not have the, like, those before them and after them, the fundaments that will unite them to say, okay, we understand what it means to be live in a Jewish democratic state that is very multifaceted and there are a lot of multicultural and a lot is very varied and with contradictory identities and opinions. And I understand what it means to work these controversies and to talk about them. So they don't have that. And they're going to be, uh, their first election is going to be in the next two years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. They're going. So I'm always around the, when I'm thinking about those things. These are the people I'm looking at in my head. And I said, okay, what do they need in order to come to the poll and to think about the future or their future in those terms? So we have a lot of work to do. And on this note, I would wish you good luck and you and the rest of us. <laughs> yes, Dr. to all of us. Dr. Tammy Hoffman of the Israel Democracy Institute and Hakeem Butzim College. Thank you very much for joining us Thank today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And many thanks to Itai Shalom, the manager of TLV One Studios, and to the Conrad Adenauer Foundation for their generous support. Now, we've got a request because many or most of you listen to us on the Apple Podcasts app and would like to ask you to please consider writing us a review. Good, bad, ugly, up to you. You too can support us by going to our website and subscribing onto our Patreon campaign. Check out our archive. It has probably close to a thousand interviews, perhaps even more. Uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and most important, join us again next week for another edition of the Tel Aviv Review. And until then, from us here in Tel Aviv, goodbye. 